Hello, I'm Tim Rogers. You are watching Kotaku.com. It's Red Dead Redemption 2, or as I like to call it, Red Dead Re-Redemption. Fun fact, contrary to popular belief, the first game in this series was called Red Dead Revolver, not Red Dead Demption. You probably want to buy this game. In that case, maybe you're watching this video because you want to hear if I recommend it or not. So here's my recommendation. If you're watching this video because you can't decide if you want to get this game, you probably should get this game. I predict that Red Dead Redemption 2 is going to result in a buy Bioshock moment of game criticism. Everyone is going to yell about it for at least 10 years. So just get it. It's huge, beautiful, alive with rich dialogue, and fun fact. Every time you watch one of my videos, realize that each minute of footage corresponds to about one hour of raw footage analysis, script writing, and video editing. Therefore, I was only able to play Red Dead Redemption 2 for 25 hours before having to begin the process of making this video. I therefore consider myself unqualified to write a review of this game. So in the interest of discouraging any comments which will call this video a review, I will exercise the following two precautions. First, I will edit this video in my own version of the popular Let's Play format, so as to blunt the accursedly authoritative tone my voice has tended to carry since kindergarten. Second, I'll say it right here and I'll say it plain. This is not a review. However, if perchance you are allergically averse to spoilers, buddy, go ahead and mute this video, open another tab, and read something else on the internet while all the ads play in this tab. Then watch this video later. And don't skip the ads that time either. Red Dead Redemption 2 starts in the snow. The seamlessness with which the cutscene transitioned to game impressed me. This sort of thing impressed me in Lost Odyssey in 2007, and it still impresses me now, even more probably. Now we ride our horses through the snow. We're off to find and kill some guys. Snow is great to put in the beginning of a game you spent seven years developing, because it's easy to use snow to show people how many wild graphics techniques you've mastered. The flickering fire lanterns cast dynamic shadows on the complex foliage. The bluster of falling and blowing snow particles shatters and scatters the full moonlight. Heavy snow shimmers on coniferous branches. The enshrouding darkness impresses palpable coldness onto the player. The only light dancing in this darkness illuminates the sparkling crystals embedded in the ground, drawing our eyes to what is absolutely the fanciest dynamic snow deformation tech yet displayed in a AAA video game. You have to press the left trigger to talk to someone. That's the same trigger you press to aim a gun. If you're using the Scuf Vantage controller for your PlayStation 4, and I recommend it, you might be interested to know that the Talk action requires a 100% trigger pull, and is thus not compatible to the physical hair trigger locks. They told me to get in cover in this cow shed, and wow, I really missed the entrance of this cow shed. You can peek out of cover. Some bad stuff is happening at this house, so we shoot some guys. The button command here says choke. Just a heads up, in this case, choke absolutely means kill. This rival gang member is not going to survive the choking. I absolutely love the winter coats in this game. Here, Dutch is wearing a dyed fleece overcoat. Now, back in 1899, fleece still meant that a sheep had died for you. Meanwhile, in 1999, fleece meant you had given 1999 to Old Navy. This woman's name is Sadie Adler. Every time I hear the name Adler, I presume it's a Sherlock Holmes reference. Man, what if Rockstar made a Sherlock Holmes video game? I mean, I know there's Sherlock Holmes video games, though what if they made one that was as detailed as this? I need some rest. I haven't slept in three days. Wow, does Dutch work for Rockstar Games? John Marston is missing. His wife Abigail begs our protagonist Arthur Morgan to go up the mountain looking for him. He may be as dumb as rocks and as dull as rusted iron. Wow, Morgan hates Marston kind of a lot. Old man Hosea here is sort of like 1990s Clint Eastwood with the voice of a cartoon weasel. We're all yeah, we're pretty worried about him. Here's young Javier Escuela. Red Dead Redemption 1 portrayed him as a loathsome degenerate. Red Dead Redemption 2 portrays him with much more nuance. This is maybe the exact moment where I realized that this game is definitely straight up Batman beginsing every member of Dutch's gang. In Red Dead Redemption 1, you just got on your horse and rode it, man. In this game, your horse has a regenerating health bar, which depletes a health core, and the same for stamina. And the horse is so slow and clunky and realistic. Everything in this game 
game is so slow and clunky and realistic. Red Dead Redemption 2 is like the Gran Turismo of cowboy games. I gotta say, these tutorials sliding in at the corner of the screen are like just off the focal point of the human eye. It's like the developers want you to ignore them. Speaking of eyeball mechanics, can I just say, shout me out in the comments if white backgrounds in games generally show you all the vitreous floaters in your eyes all the time. Red Dead Redemption 2's snowy sunlit mountain in HDR lights up the white blood cells in my retinal vasculature just like real snow would. Now that we've covered human ophthalmology, let's move on to equine pulmonology. Here Javier says we can't go much farther on the horses. I don't think we can go much further on the horses. Fun fact, horse lungs implode at high elevations, resulting in instant death. This could be part of the reason why John Marston's injured horse here had died so suddenly. Horses sure are impractically constructed animals. Your horse is also a portable storage shed. You can store a bunch of guns and hats on your horse. Uh, one thing that kept happening to me throughout the first couple hours of the game is that whenever there was a tutorial for navigating a menu, the menu didn't work perfectly until after the tutorial was over. So I swear I wasn't being incompetent here with the horse storage UI. It was just not working the way the instructions said it would. If you just played Red Dead Redemption 1 immediately before playing this game, you're gonna hear this guy yell, John, where are you? and you're gonna think he's talking to you. Marston got attacked by wolves and they ripped his face up. I legit cannot believe that the first time we see John Marston in Red Dead Redemption 2, we also learn the origin of his scars. I'm a tiny bit disappointed. Then again, I always am. For now, we got this. Hmm, I don't believe we got this was a colloquial expression until the early 2000s. So I'm gonna wheel out the chalkboard of anachronism and strike one tick mark on it. Watch, he's about to lick his lips casually during conversation. Of course, Dutch. Thank you, son. That's fantastic. Look at the mission transition here. In Red Dead Redemption 1, you approached the mission start point and the game faded to black and showed you a title card. Now you have to actually talk to the mission giver, and then the mission starts seamlessly. We're gonna starve to death up here, Mr. Morgan. We're okay. We have a few cans of food. I love it. Look at how moist Pearson's hair is. Witness Arthur Morgan's effortlessly period authentic pronunciation of the word preferable. Assorted salted awful. Starving would be preferable. The voice directors did spectacular work. I legit eld MAO that even Rockstar, makers of the game where you can blow up a police car with a rocket launcher and the game where you can blow up a police car with a rocket launcher 5, have put a bow and arrow into their cowboy game. Your horse's stamina meter symbol is a lightning bolt, so at this point I began to always think of my horse stamina as Hoof thunder. Oh yeah, this cowboy's got Batman vision. Witness how ridiculously little bow drawing stamina Arthur Morgan has. Look how wildly his aim fluctuates when he's out of stamina. This is a perfect encapsulation of how ridiculously underwater it feels to shoot anything at all in this game. Red Dead Redemption 2 is the Gran Turismo of aiming a weapon. Wow, this looks just like real bloody snow. Tracking and shooting this deer felt pretty good. It's like there's a whole tracking, luring, and hunting game embedded in this game about robbing banks, stagecoaches, and trains. Why can't we just hide out and hunt animals and live peacefully? Oh wait, I'm the one who chooses to do the story missions. Oh no, am I the one causing all the trouble? If I don't do the missions, can I just hunt animals and live in the camp? You gotta carry this big floppy deer back to your horse and put it on and then ride back with it. Your horse is slower with the deer on it. Here I accidentally bump my horse into Charles's horse. Notice how low-key he is when he says, careful. I still wonder that most nights. Careful. In Red Dead Redemption 1, he would have yelled, Idiot, watch where you're going! Before immediately lowering his voice and continuing the dialogue, Arthur tells Charles that he's been with Dutch for 20 years, since he was a boy. He says the Dutch saved most of them, and that's why they need to stick by him. This game genuinely feels like it's shaping up to be about being in a cult gotta confess, I went to Catholic Sunday school when I was a kid, and this is making me uncomfortable. I was absolutely not prepared for how intense this skinning animation was going to be. Oh. 
In the first game, you just saw John Marston's face while he screamed something weirdly detached about how much the animal stinks inside, and some barbecue sauce splashed on the screen. This, meanwhile, looks like they did an art department-wide field trip to a butcher shop. I know for a fact that Rockstar Games employs a lot of artists. That must have been a butcher shop the size of an airport. Before starting the game, I set a timer for one hour. At this exact point in the game, the timer went off, so I opened the pause menu. It looks a lot like the pause menu from Red Dead Redemption 1. I tapped into the progress screen. It said I was 2% of the way through the story. If we use math and divide 100 by 2, we develop an estimate that Red Dead Redemption 2's story is about 50 hours long. It may interest you to know that I've played the game now for 25 hours, and, and maybe because I participated in a few side quests, I'm only 30% of the way through the story, not the 50% that my initial calculation would have had me believe. Here Arthur talks while smoking a cigarette, and it sounds like the voice actor had something clamped in his lips when reading the line. Both been through a lot recently. We hardly back on our feet yet. That's good voice direction. I am not even kidding. I would wear this coat that Dutch is wearing. Just looking at the warm texture of that coat makes me feel cold. I'm getting too old for that life. Is that a Lethal Weapon reference? Actually, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people are getting too old for a lot of stuff. It's, it's part of life, so it's probably not always a Lethal Weapon reference. I'm probably getting too old for thinking that every time someone says they're getting too old for something, it's always a Lethal Weapon reference. I killed a bunch of dudes, perhaps in an attempt to simulate the famously inferior gunsmithery and crooked pistol barrels of the end of the 19th century. It feels like you're underwater aiming a harpoon gun at a guppy a hundred yards away. It is hilarious, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Finally, every anecdote my dad told me about how, you know, cowboys dueled like six feet apart from one another because the gun barrels were almost always crooked and inaccurate is put to flying colorful use in a video game. After the fight, you loot the bodies. This guy was carrying opened chewing tobacco. Was it opened as in the protective seal was off, or is it like half empty? I feel like if they're going to specify that it's open, they'd also specify that it's half empty, right? And it's not just one can of opened chewing tobacco, it's two. Why had he opened two cans of chewing tobacco? Did he open one of them and find something terribly wrong with it? Is one of these cans of opened chewing tobacco poisoned? Which one is it? I'll never know, because I killed the guy. Meanwhile, there are perfect little plausible realisms peppering the game. Look how my prisoner's hat falls off as I throw him on my shoulder. Here I am, again, failing to hitch my horse. It took me a couple hours to get used to the hyper-nuanced horse controls. This is a moment of genuinely charismatic riding. I got a saying, my friend. We shoot, fellas. Is need shooting, save fellas, is need saving, and feed them, is need feeding. We are gonna find out what you need. In this tiny moment here, we can see why Dutch has inspired all these people to travel with him and look for the geography and the opportunity upon which to lay the foundations of their own utopia. I absolutely love this title card. Here Red Dead Redemption 2 is seriously just showing off. This is the same environment in which we've spent the opening hours of the game, only with some of the snow melted. The dialogue in this game is almost on a David Mamet level. One of David Mamet's rules for dialogue writing is that drama does not live within a line in which two characters discuss a third character who is not present during the dialogue. I would love to clip out and analyze a hundred little dialogues from Red Dead Redemption 2, though that would make this video too long, and I've got a moment where I get kicked in the face by a horse that I really need to get to, so I present this early dialogue, which struck me as perfectly written. You're still here then? I owe you. Yeah. And you'll pay me. But for the moment, just rest. Arthur, I think it's time for the train. Want me to come? Of course I do, but look at you. I was always ugly, Dutch. It's just a scratch. Don't lie still, son. Hello, Abigail. It's Jackie. The boy wanted to see you, John. He's seen me now. Or what's left of me. What about you? Guess I was hoping to see a corpse. <laughs> Bide your time. You'll see plenty of them. You're a rotten man, John Marston. He is an idiot, Abigail. We all know it. 
I grew up on US military bases in the 1980s and the 1990s. For the longest time, my primary social interaction was me and my brother pretending to be cowboys in the woods with his friends. I think the cowboy fantasy appealed to my brother because cowboys had guns and often killed the horses right out from under the bad guys. For me, however, the cowboy daydream was all about seeing a sort of a steep hill and finding some way to naturally say, hold up here on the ridge. Hold up here on the ridge. So, Red Dead Redemption 2 definitely appeals to my very specific inner 11-year-old. Witness here is a tutorial prompt informs the player that Dutch was, in fact, not being sarcastic. Is Bill there? Yeah. You wanna head down? See how he's getting on? Okay. Whoa! At exactly this moment, I lost my hat. This man on the right, on top of the train, was the one who shot it off. I would not recover this hat before the end of the mission because I was absolutely unaware of the moment it had been shot off. After a shootout is done, you can loot the bodies. You can steal their pocket watches and money clips and medicine and chewing tobacco. Sometimes the law shows up, and that makes looting unreasonably more difficult. The only penalty for looting all the bodies after some of the story mission shootouts is you have to listen to whoever your mission partner is, yell at you to hurry up, and come over to the next mission blip. What are you doing? Get over here! There are some guys holed up in the armored caboose, so Dutch tells us to wake them up with gunfire. This is the perfect opportunity for the game to tutorialize rapid hip firing of the revolver. So yeah, we empty the chambers on this train car. Finally, a shooting game challenge suitable for playing with a controller. <laughs> Dutch lets you decide what to do with the guards. You can let them go, tell them to get on the train, or shoot them. When I played, I got two of them to go on the train, then one of them ran away. I shot him. I don't even know why I shot him. What was he going to do? He was probably going to die out there in the cold. I feel really weird and bad for shooting that guy. Worse than I have felt for shooting a guy in a game since the first guy I shot on accident in Grand Theft Auto 3. Wow, these letters are handwritten. Look at that. I wonder if it's a 4K texture. Aw oh, man, you can just press a button and read the letter as plain text. This feels kinda like a compromise. This is a game about cowboys, so I feel like the developers should stick to their guns. Though, yeah, for the record, I definitely read all of the letters in this typeface. I'm not gonna squint at that cursive man. My sofa's like 10 feet away from my TV. Oh, I guess we started the train with those two guys on board. So is it just going to crash? Did I kill those guys? Now we're coming down off the mountains. After two hours in the snow, the game is letting the sun shine on something green. As Arthur drives the wagon, old man Hosea tells young man Charles about how the white man stole the land from the Native Americans. The game then deftly sidesteps making any kind of political statement by having Arthur jump in and tell the young listener that Never forget, this here's a con man, Charles, born and bred. Just cause it sounds fancy don't mean he knows a damn thing about what he's talking about. After we set up camp, Dutch lays out the ground rules. And remember, whatever it is that you find, the camp gets its slice. Now be sensible out there. I feel like, game design-wise at least, this game feels a lot more like being in the Mafia than Grand Theft Auto ever did. Now we're in Chapter 2. It's a couple of weeks later. Wow, Arthur Morgan's beard has grown a lot. I wish there was some way to wear all of these clothes at the same time. Anyone who's ever listened to two strangers talking about video games in the early 2000s has probably heard one friend recommend Grand Theft Auto to another, with some variant of the following sentence. You don't even have to do the missions. Just ignore the missions and have fun, dude. I personally think the missions are very fun, though that's just me. Anyway, this is the exact point at which Red Dead Redemption 2 allows the players to just ignore the missions and quote-unquote have fun. And given that my job is inexplicably to get paid to play the hottest video games weeks before they're released to the public, I figured I needed to ditch the story for a bit and see about ignoring the missions and just having fun, dude. So I got on my horse and set out for the nearby by town of Valentine. Here the town looms up on the horizon. Watch closely now. Morning. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, so what happened was, my horse is an idiot and I turned a little wrong. I violently collided with this other guy's horse. The horse's spaghetti wrestled into a clump of meat in the mud, right on top of this cowpoke who was probably, I'd say, made out of glass. This lawman up here on this little ridge didn't need a hand signal from no doctor to know it was a murder, at which point he shot me in the butt cheek. I tried to walk away. Then I figured maybe I could surrender. As I approached the lawman, figuring to surrender, he shot me again. So I shot him twice as he approached me and reloaded his carbine. I shot him a third time, this time in the kidney, as he turned around. He retreated. I do not think he died. I headed back to the main street with my revolver in my hand. A lawman moved up and traded bullets with me. I got him once. He got me twice. The second shot went ahead and took residence inside my skull. So it was that before Arthur Morgan ever set foot in the town of Valentine, he was wanted for the killing of a civilian with the bounty of $45 on his head. Arthur Morgan awakes from a fever dream and heads back into Valentine. Me and Arthur went into the general store. I absolutely love this shopping catalog. The tone of the ink is accurate. The illustrations are perfect. You can even zoom in and read all of the authentic copywriting. You can also walk around the store and pick up every item in the catalog and rotate Arthur's hands as he holds them. You might spend hours staring at shimmering biscuit tins as they catch the sunlight. It's like Shenmue with cowboys. In the bar, I met a squirrely man writing the biography of a liquor comatose legendary gunfighter. This biographer reminds me of the character W.W. W. Beauchamp in the film Unforgiven, who was writing a biography of the gunfighter English Bob, played by none other than Richard Harris. Why in the hell are you so close to me? What in the hell is your problem? Don't mind me. Well, you're a goddamn idiot. I think I had this exact same conversation word for word in Oakland, California in 2012. Again on the subject of human ophthalmology, witness this eyes adjustment effect as Arthur Morgan crashes through the swinging saloon doors. We got a wild one here. <laughs> hey, all right. This is perhaps an ingenious trick to mask loading times. How many times have you seen textures pop in on a 3D game? Perhaps behind the effect of Arthur's eyes adjusting to the dimness within the saloon or the brightness outside this cabin, textures are loading and filling in. This effect perfectly, simultaneously assists both the performance of the software and the player's immersion. You end up getting into an old-fashioned saloon brawl, the likes of which Red Dead Redemption 1 never knew. Eventually, you're beating this dude up in the street as the whole town gets gathers to watch. This felt like a moment. When I had to start the whole game over a couple days later, this battle happened at night with all the sodium lamps lit up and flickery. The first time I had these ominous storm clouds on the horizon. What I'm saying is I think scenes like this in this game look good no matter what time of day you do the mission. Are those apples dodecahedrons? I take back everything I said about the graphics. It's 2018, people. Can we get some round apples? I'm just joking, by the way. This, this game is gorgeous and you know whatever about this i also want to say i'm gonna have a really good time looking through the youtube comment history of the inevitable person who shows up to say that this game's graphics look quote unquote just like a nintendo 64 game like i said i played the first 20 hours of this game twice in this mission you do for the reverend this poker hand is exactly the same every time so that's a little tip you can win with two pairs eights and queens if you stick with it so just bet as much as you can i mean just go in swinging. Don't fold like I did here. I was like, what? I don't want to play poker right now. So I just folded. The poker in this mission is optional, though like, I mean, two pair, you know? Giddy up, as they would say. The Reverend gets his foot stuck in a train track because he's drunk. I did not see the UI in the corner because it's tiny and my TV is huge and my eyes were glued to that big, beautiful locomotive. I thought this was a cutscene, so I died. They've done it, everybody. I just can't tell the difference between gameplay and cutscene anymore. You put the Reverend on the back of your horse and ride back up to camp with him. This was a couple hours into the game, and I'd come to think of the camp as like a supermarket. Like, it was a place I went, had trouble parking, and did some really slow business. So yeah, this part will remind anybody from the Midwest of all those times they drove into a Walmart parking lot with their best friend sleeping on the roof of their car. <laughs> I have no idea what I was thinking when I wrote that.
When I go over to the donation table, Pearson comes over from where he was standing to slide in and stand next to the item donation menu. Like, he's the one who's supposed to be taking these things off my hands. I'd rather it just be a menu if they're not going to, like, animate him taking the animal carcasses from me. Because this makes it look like he's just kind of standing there. I saw a bear who was stupid enough to be existing. I could have held the L1 button and retrieved a shotgun from my saddlebag, though some sudden inspiration made me see fit to challenge this hideous beast with my six gun. He ripped me up pretty good. The animation for skinning a bear is incredibly disgusting. Peta is gonna learn about this and make some really bad tweets. I just want to say for the record that I haven't eaten meat in 30 years and I think Peta is terrible. I wish they would stop saying stuff the way they do, convincing people that everyone who doesn't eat meat is as boring as them. When I saw the bloody slashes on my dude's jacket back, I got excited. I wondered if the clothing stays dynamically damaged. Rockstar games are all about quote-unquote user stories, as tech industry dirtbags call them. How cool would it be if emergent moments in the game could hard-bake a user story right into every single piece of equipment? Well, the bear claw marks healed. Since I'm narrating this days after playing, let's use the time codes in my video file to determine how long it takes jacket scars to fade away. Turns out it's 6 minutes, 25 seconds, and 7 frames. At 30 frames per second, of course, because this game runs at 30 frames per second. To counteract the surge of emotions I felt upon the obliteration of my immersion when my jacket scars healed, I decided Arthur Morgan was Wolverine. Like, he's probably going to change his last name to Logan at the end of this game. So what I'm saying is, it was time to check out the shaving features. Logan commits the grievous error of attempting to walk into a cabin which might house some do-batters. Luckily, his friend Kieran has freakishly good reflexes. You all right? You all right? Oh nice, my Spider-Man update installed. To be honest, I don't know if I'll ever finish Spider-Man now that this game is out. I don't think I'll finish Assassin's Creed either. This hint prompt literally tells me to beat up the debtor. I hope the people in charge of my college loans aren't playing this game. That's a joke, I paid my college loans back in like 2006. I shot a deer in the river and ran my horse over it. Morgan rides up to a farm to collect a debt from a dying man. He kicks the man's head through a fence, though not exactly how you might think he would. My horse was out of hoof thunder, so I thought I'd feed her a carrot from my saddlebag. It turned out I had no idea what I was doing because Arthur straight up crunched that thing down himself. I laughed extremely hard for several minutes when this happened. Now I'm sitting here looking at this footage as though I'm reading a book someone else wrote and I'm thinking, who is, what is this man who would so cold-bloodedly deprive an animal of beta carotene right in front of its face? This game is trying really hard to make me feel like a sleazy weirdo and it's working because here I am sneaking around someone's house at night and stealing their valuables while they're snoring right there in the bed. Check out this absolutely incredible incredible music transition, which would have been a lot better if I'd been able to get on the stagecoach with a little more efficiency. Get on, dear boy. Just when we almost got away, calamity struck. I screamed at this part because the pairing of the incident itself and my companion Hosea's choice of words is priceless. Less problems the better. Are you kidding me? Can you just imagine like blasting into a deer with your Humvee and there's just like a big old like car wash bubble suds of blood on the on the windshield of your car and like within not even one second you just turn on the windshield wipers and say are you kidding me, kidding me. 
just like as a knee-jerk reflex. Dutch suggests I take Lenny out drinking. We go to a bar and there's this excellent no consequences QTE where I can press a button to drink, though only when Lenny is the one talking. It's so brilliant, I missed every opportunity to drink this beer the first time I played. The whole mission is smart. The goal is to drink and have a good time without causing trouble. So when a guy annoys Arthur, you have to QTE button mash to make Arthur decide not to beat the guy up. The mission from this point on is too good. I don't want to spoil any more of it for anybody. Red Dead Redemption 2's plot concerns nefarious outlaws, though it does its best to portray one of those outlaws as a cold-blooded killer who probably should be put in jail and then hanged. However, you free him from jail, and he then proceeds to immediately do three disgusting things. The player is in no way invited to sympathize with this guy. Arthur Morgan, the player character, goes out of his way to say that this guy should be put to death for his stupid violence. Yet as the thunderous storm clears after the atrocious act, Red Dead Redemption 2 bathes the player in what may be the most beautiful display of HDR lighting effects I have yet seen in a video game. So, on the one hand, gruesome crime. On the other hand, cutting-edge graphics technology. You know that old quote about how insanity is repeating the same mistakes and expecting different results? Well, here I am shooting a red can, expecting it to explode. It doesn't explode, so I shoot two more. Neither of them explode. None of these three red paint cans explode. Has Red Dead Redemption 2 given us the first AAA red barrel of the 2010s that does not explode when shot? Come to think of it, I shouldn't be surprised. The game is called Red Dead Redemption, not Red Keg Explosion. Trombone sound effect. Oh, that's, I put a note in there to make myself remember to put in the trombone sound effect. My notes here say, good hip kill. Let's take a look. Wow, that is a good hip kill. Fun fact, I typed all of these words before coming into this soundproof room with the microphone in it. I knew exactly what this note was alluding to. I'm a liar, and I love shooting from the hip in video games. As our protagonist carries a conversation with a religious cult leader, the player has the opportunity to decide whether Arthur Morgan is an atheist or agnostic. What path have you chosen, sir? I'm still searching, I guess. That's neat. This boy hugs Arthur. I'll keep track of the total number of hugs Arthur gets in this game. Arthur's last word on religion is profound. There ain't no shame in looking for a better world. Forgive me, but your father's a bully and a coward. Don't listen to him. I wonder what Arthur's relationship is with his own dad. And I wonder if this is an allusion to Rockstar Games' Bully Scholarship Edition. This kid mentions someone named Barry Linton. You know Barry Linton's dead? I can't help feeling like this is definitely a reference to Stanley Kubrick's film Barry Linden. When I got back to camp, Lenny was standing watch with an invisible gun. If they're so concerned with evasion of the law, I don't see why they don't just make everything invisible. Arthur's gonna take a little kid fishing. His horse's saddlebag is apparently magical. My pony's name is Bloppy, by the way. That's short for Floppy Bloppy, the boneless pony. This looks as good a spot as any. Was my pony literally waiting for the kid to get off before it scattered its horse trash on the ground? That's pretty polite for a beast. This tutorial dialogue severely did not expect me to have played both Mario Party 2 and Sega Bass Fishing within like three months of each other. Now seems like he's taking a rest now. I'm gonna try reeling him in nice and steady. Okay, look, this dialogue is extremely good. You better sleep with your eyes open. Yo, you're gonna sleep with your chest open if you ain't careful, boy. Here, Arthur and two companions are riding on a horse-drawn carriage. Charlie asks, Hey, all the horses untethered? Think so. Good. 
They should follow on behind us. This is a plausible way for a character to mention something that has direct impact on the gameplay. It also has the effect of foreshadowing to me that I will definitely not be leaving this mission on this particular vehicle. Here we are robbing a train. Look how gross this is. I gotta say, I feel really bad for hitting these people, though. What am I gonna do? The tutorial prompt literally says, beat the passenger. The crime we perpetrated upon the railway passengers requires a violent escape from the authorities. I had at that time considered success guaranteed. Then my horse went against my imagination and did not jump this fence. Clearly I had approached it from the wrong angle. I suppose the struggle in the dirt was enough to really sweaty up my bro's face here. The Wild West sure was moist. Once cleared of the reach of the long arm of the law, I immediately tore across what appeared to be an open field. With immediacy, I crashed into a tree. It turns out I had gotten stuck in the geometry of an orchard whose owners enjoyed the murder of trespassers. This resulted in my worst death yet. Damn it. Okay, my girl. Get it. So it was my steed Bloppy, aka Floppy Bloppy the Boneless Pony, had died there under that tree in that orchard, so I went to Valentine and bought a new horse. I accidentally learned that you can't give a horse no name, because giving a horse no name counts as, a uh, profanity. It's also something an outlaw would do. So I named my horse Idget. Not 45 seconds out the gat dang stable, Idget became impossible to handle in the vicinity of the hitching post. Just when I was thinking that now I'd done seen everything, another individual standing by the carnage declared that now he too had done seen everything. Now done seen everything. Well, the law yelled at me a bit, so me and Idget had to go lie low by standing in a field across the street while we waited for the red circle of the law to forget about us so we could go do the next mission. Any excuse for a little extra nosebleed is worth my time. What? While I was on my way to a mission, a tree trunk fell on a guy. I went over to try to help out, though I guess I just barely missed the window for holding the triangle to help lift the tree trunk and instead initiated the sit down and rest command, which was a hilarious thing to do in this exact situation. I felt bad for the guy, so I gave him five dollars. That was a lot of money back then. I didn't even owe it to him. That there Arthur Morgan sure was a weird cowboy. You ain't scaring nobody. Hmm. Our target is right around this corner. I bet we could get a good view if we held up on this ridge. Hold up on this ridge. Nice. I'm really sorry to keep harping on tiny little graphical glitches, though. Watch Arthur's hand and the strap he's using to lead this horse. Got that thing in black water. We already seen Pinkerton's. Now witness how effortlessly Arthur hitches his horse, Idget. Let's head up to the ridge up there. By any chance, are we gonna hold up on it once we get there? As I have previously insinuated, I would be here for weeks if I highlighted every dialogue exchange I love in this game. I'm trying to restrain myself, though here's a particularly great one regarding the resale of some obviously stolen livestock. They're okay. Well, you seen better around here? I've seen ones with less ambiguity about their provenance. <laughs> Meanwhile, here's some of that good old Max Payne level writing. We ain't kids no more. Well, we never really was. One character makes a statement, and then the other character dismisses it with terse nihilism. And here's an example of the in-game battle cries functioning as tutorial tips. Get behind the wagon as we push on it. You can use it as cover. I feel like Dutch is almost the sort of guy to say this exactly this way. Here's a really good example of our dude yelling because his companion is too far behind him, and then you can hear how quiet his companion's voice is. Put enough time and distance between you and the problem, eventually it went away. Hold on a second. 
This is the stuff that I like. Look at the realism with which bodies flinch during a kill animation. It's driving me blood wild. I submit this next blast as proof that I meant what I said earlier about Peta. Dealt with. I don't know what happened though, Idget got scared and I had to run around for a while. Out of nowhere, an agent of the People for Ethical Treatment of Animals, acting on the excuse that a $45 bounty was to be paid on my head for that accidental murder I committed several weeks prior in the vicinity of Valentine, rode up and tried to give me some guff. I just so happened to not be in the market for buying any guff, so at first I was like, buddy are you kidding me? And then he shot me so I had to kill him. I figured I was out of horror at least temporarily, so I could borrow that of a dead man long enough to get back to camp. I'm not gonna lie, probably I was gonna shoot his horse in the woods right by my camp, because in my mind that's just what kind of fella Arthur Morgan is. So I ran up behind this horse, absolutely forgetting the tutorial from the stable at the very beginning of the game about how you have to calm a horse. With a dark, keen viciousness, Arthur Morgan ran right up behind that agitated horse, and that agitated horse kicked Arthur Morgan in the head, and Arthur Morgan died. Two weeks ago, when I was playing through Red Dead Redemption 1, I speculated about Red Dead Redemption 2 with a couple friends. We talked about how the horses in Red Dead Redemption 2 reportedly have scrotums that expand in the heat and contract in the cold. We speculated about what other realisms the developers might have inflicted upon the simulated animals. The idea that interested me most was the possibility that, perhaps for the first time ever in an open world video game, we'd finally have horses that kick you in the head and kill you if you walk up behind them. Them. I bet my friend two dollars this detail would be in the game, and there it is. You know, both my mom and my dad have, like, relatives that were killed by being kicked in the head by a horse. It's really scary to think about. It's a shame that was the end of Arthur Morgan, though. He was shaping up to be a good man. Now he's dead in the dirt like a dog. I'm joking. Of course I'm gonna play the rest of this game, probably all weekend. This is the best game I have played in many years. It is rich with exuberant detail, and I absolutely love the story so far. It brings 39-year-old me back to the time I was playing Final Fantasy VI at age 15. Hey, Final Fantasy VI also came out in October. I played through that whole a game in a stormy October weekend while chain eating punch bowl after punch bowl full of macaroni and cheese. And I might do the same for Red Dead Redemption 2 because, after all, I was born stupid. However, I will not die hungry. Video games forever. Kotaku.com I'd hardly stepped off the carriage and I'd taken in the whole place. I suppose some might call it. Never mind, all right? I don't want your help.